My name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm the executive director of Afikra. Thanks so much for joining. It is my honor to uh, introduce our special guest. Philip Chantar is a senior lecturer in music at the School of Performing Arts at the University of Malta, where he teaches courses in ethnomusicology, world music, methods of research in music, Mediterranean music of the oral tradition, and Maltese popular music. Following his first degree from the University of Malta, he furthered his musical studies at the University of Durham in the UK, where he graduated with an MA in music. Uh, in 2006, he graduated with a PhD from the University of Sheffield with a thesis focused on the Arab Andalusian music of Libya, Maluf, which we'll be talking about today. He serves, uh, served as the head of music studies department between 2016 and 2020, and is the author of the Maluf in Contemporary Libya, an Arab Andalusian musical tradition, which came out in 2012, and studies in Malti, uh, Maltese popular music, which came out in 2021. Um, Philip, thank you so much for joining Africa Conversations. Thank you, Mikey. It's a, a great pleasure for me to be with you and to be part of this very interesting project. Thank you so much. So, I love the fact, you know, we always talk, I mentioned this in the introduction, we always talk about the Arab world defined very broadly. And Malta um, really serves as a classic example of a place that at one point, um, the people who lived in Malta, you know, hundreds of years ago, really considered themselves to be part of that, that world as well. Um, as somebody growing up in Malta, uh, who grew up in Malta, is that a correct statement, what I just said? Or is that something that people would roll their eyes at in Malta? Like, no, we were never part of the Arab world. Walk me through no, that. Well, that's a very interesting question indeed. I mean, Malta is in between, isn't it? Um, um, it's a Mediterranean, Mediterranean island. Um, as a population, we are 450,000. Um, an area of um, um, 360 kilometers squared, more or less. Yes, I mean, the Maltese feel that they are Mediterraneans. Let me put it that way. Um, uh, we, well, we were conquered for 220 years by the Arabs. Okay, so um, uh, we have so many things um, in our culture, in our language, for instance, our language, Maltese, is a Semitic language. You know, we have uh, words that you use in Arabic, like Tifel, uh, Dar, Tayyip. These are all words that we also use in Maltese, in Mo in Maltese sorry. So basically, um, yes, the Maltese feel that they are Mediterranean, that they are somewhere in between European culture, we are now also part of the EU. Um, at the same time, we are very much aware of our historical past, of um, you know the Semitic element in our culture, and it's a really interesting, nice mix, believe me. Yeah, it's like Sicily. Sicily has a very similar, very similar sort of uh, menu of ingredients. <laughs> yeah, it's true, isn't it? So, um, you're a musician yourself. Did you grow up? Um, playing or specializing in Maltese music? Um, well, um, well, I started as a, <clears throat> a young boy. I mean, I'm coming from uh, a family of musicians. We, we, are, we were six in the family. Um, three of my brothers were brass players, so they were brass players, and I thought it's always good to so, uh, you know, learn a brass instrument. And I learned to play the trombone. So, um, uh, and then, so I learned the trombone, I played in various bands in Malta, um, and then I joined the Manuel Theatre Orchestra, now it's the um, Malta National Orchestra. Um, I also played in rock bands, in jazz bands, you know, I was quite active as a, as a trombonist. Um, but apart from that, I remember my father, he bought a piano, and I thought, you know, it's worth also learning some piano as well. So um, uh, I learned some piano, and then I furthered my, my uh, music education privately. And um, then um, I went into Arabic music, but that was when I was, when I was um, a graduate student at Sheffield University, at uh, Durham University. Um, well, but my upbringing is mainly in classical art music. 
Well, I was always interested in Maltese Anna, in Maltese folk music. I was always interested in that because um, I really love the way, you know, um, verses are improvised and matched with music. And that was really something um, that, that really fascinated me, sort of. Um, and I always loved, let's say, in Maltese Anna, the way certain events are preserved in songs, eh? in Maltese folk songs. Um, uh, yes, but um, uh, I'm trained. I'm trained originally. I'm initially. I'm my training is as a is, is you know is very mainstream um, in in classical music. So, but Arabic music came into my life later on, sort of. Before we get to the Arabic music coming into your life, I'm curious just to understand the musical backdrop that you grew up in. How similar for those of us who do, who don't know. Um, how similar is Maltese music to sort of Andalusian music or um, neighboring regions? For those of us who don't know anything about Maltese music, what yeah. is a sort of an approximation that we can use as a reference point? Well, um, we can say that in Malta we have, um, you know, um, Malta's folk song, which is Anna. Okay, um, uh, it sounds quite, quite similar to Arabic music, sort of. Um, uh, for instance, in Ana, there is a subgenre known as Ana Bilixur, that is melismatic singing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you sing this kind of, of, of Ana, you realize that there are quite a lot of similarities between, you know, the use of the language with music and um, Arabic music with me melismas and, uh, you know, with um, certain inflections in the voice. But then we also have a very strong tradition of wind band playing, wind band playing. Um, uh, we had several military bands here in Malta during the British colonial period. So, uh, and we, there is also the influence from Italy, uh, the Italian banda, uh, yeah. the band, the wind band. In fact, even in our villages, we have several band clubs and they provide free tuition to students as well. Um, uh, then we also have, you know, pop music, popular music, orchestral music. We also have a very strong tradition of church music as well in yeah. Malta. Okay. Um, um, so, uh, well, we have this kind of um, uh, nice blend between our music as Maltese and uh, music imported from abroad. And we always try to find ourselves in this kind of mix, sort of. Yeah. We, are, we always feel that we are in between, in between. It's not a bad place to be. <laughs> um, so before we start talking about uh, Libyan music, which you, um, you, know, you, you wrote your PhD on, the Arab Andalusian music, I want to play a clip from a video that we just that you and I discussed previously before getting on the call, um, and this is a clip that uh, you and I we talked about that may be a, a, a good representation of the Libyan Maluf, right? Yeah. Before before I click uh, before I click this, is Maluf a genre? Is it a song? Is it a mode? Is it a what is it Maluf? Right, um, that's a very, very good question because the word Maluf um, in Libya and even in, in Tunisia, it is, it is used to refer to what we call the Naubat Maluf, which is basically a song cycle, okay, that traveled um, from Andalus in Spain, then to the Maghreb, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, etc. But it can also refer to other musical genres like um, the Casida or um, compositions on Muashahat. So this word Maluf in Libya has a very broad meaning. It, in general, it refers to um, classical Arabic music in general. But when you say now but Maluf, like the, 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 the music that we are going to listen to, when we say now but Maluf, that refers to this uh, to this um, song cycle, it's like a, a suite. Uh, it's, it, it is um, uh, the now, but it's like um, a composition with different sections and different time signatures, 
but in the same maqam, in the same maqam. Okay, and this is unique to Libya? The no, neighboring... I mean, no, no, we find the, the Nauba, the Andalusian Nauba, we find it in Morocco, we find it in Algeria, you know, in Tunisia, but they all come with their own variations. Um, yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to play a little bit, then I want to talk to you about instrumentation and um, sort of ornamentation and stuff like that. So let's play a little bit first. Can you hear? to stop here for a second um i want to play a little bit more in a second but how is it that somebody as familiar with the the genre as you can immediately identify this as being uh libyan maluf and the reason why i want i say that is because before we selected this there was another song that i was going to play and immediately you said nope that's from tunis that's wrong so what are the things that you are looking for to identify this is Libyan Maluf. Yeah. Well, um, yes, I identify that from the from the rhythm used, from the rhythmic most, uh, from the rhythmic mode used. I mean that it's innate force, that it's uh, musaddar. So I identify the Maluf from the rhythmic modes, hmm? from the first rhythmic modes. Um, you might have an alba with you know first rhythmic mode in eight fours and then it changes to to eight fours later on. So the rhythm, the rhythmic cycle, is the most um, identifiable element uh, in, a, in, in the Nauba, especially, um, I mean, in the, in the Libyan Nauba. What we are listening to there, it's a very interesting example because the Nauba, the Nauba Maluf, this Andalusian Nauba, exists in two forms. It exists in the context of Zawaya, Sufi lodges. And the Nauba there is less refined. It's not the kind of you know Nauba that we have just listened to. So it is very raw, if I if I can say that. Um, but this is the professionalized Nauba. Uh, you have an orchestra playing the Nauba together. It is well rehearsed. Yeah. I mean um, nowadays they are even uh, writing the Nauba, the melody. You know, to to to. I mean, to, to make the memorization of the Nauba more convenient and to facilitate and to facilitate rehearsals mainly. Yeah. Okay, so this is the professionalized Nauba. I experienced both both um, aspects of the Nauba. I entered the Zawaya Sufilogist, and I attended for you know. Um, um, rituals in the Medina, mm -hmm. but I also attended for rehearsals and concerts with the um, Libby Maluf Orchestra. So yeah. I experienced both. So um, the text that they're reading, just to keep on to understand two questions. One, um, is this a text that is always used? Um, that's the first question. And the second question is, where is this performed? Is, it, is this a court? Is this a court genre or is this a celebratory thing? Or in, in what cases is this uh, performed? Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. I mean, what we are listening to, this professionalized Nauba, um, 
let's start from the text. Yes, there is um, a kind of text which can sound as standards, okay? At least in its beginning. Why? Because in the course of an Auba, the leader of the Ensamp, especially in the context of Sufi lodges, may also add his own verses, new verses, mm -hmm. because basically you have a melody which is repeated over and over again. In the, in the um, professionalized Nauba, the text is standard. The text is standard because, I mean, um, um, uh, it's written normally, they learn it. Um, uh, when they enter the studio, they have to be well rehearsed. Um, uh, so in the professionalized form, the text of the Nauba is more standard. No, in the Sufi, in, in the context of Sufi lodges, they can, the Sheikh may come up with his own new verses. And this okay. is fascinating because you have old verses mixing up with verses which are created on sites, actually on sites. Um, I probably missed your other question. My so, second question is where, where is this performed usually? Is this folk art? Is this art for the court? Is this art for celebrations? Again, the, yeah, the Maluf as Zawiya, I mean, the Maluf as it is performed in the context of Sufi lodges that is performed during the Hadra, you know, every Thursday evening. And uh, it is also performed during Maulid celebrations, eh? Maulid celebrations. It is performed during wedding celebrations as well. The Maluf El Lida, that is the broadcasting Maluf, the professionalized Maluf, Maluf, it's normally performed during festivals on uh, the Libyan radio station, on the Libyan yeah. TV station. Um, so the context is different. The context is different. Okay. Let's play a little more of that. Let's just so that we can get a see. Let's take a to a different part. So let's talk about some of your research. Um, when did you, you know, you, you wrote this book, you started working on it in grad school for your PhD. Um, I'm curious, how did you find yourself interested in Libyan music? Um, you weren't doing your PhD in, in Libya. Um, how did you find yourself interested in this work and how did you go about doing the sort of ethno ethnography? Yeah. Um... Yes, I, it all started in 2002, actually, or slightly before um, 2010 Um At the time, you know, I was thinking about a research topic, a research topic. I felt <clears throat> somewhat um, torn in between doing something about Malta and doing something, you know, away from home. And I really wanted for my PhD to experience ethnomusicology away from home, because, you know, when you are doing something at home, you take so many things for granted. And um, I really wanted to do something, something different. And I was at a reception, you know, um, uh, one of those receptions organized by the Libyan embassy in Malta. And I met someone, you know, a guy who was there and who still lives in Malta and you know he was also a musician and we started talking about Arabic music and he told me you know in, in Libya we have Andalusian music we have some really fine Andalusian music um, I said you know I had read something about it before but I didn't think so much about it um, but a day or two after, I went back to my literature, to that literature, you know, to literature about um, the Moroccan Andalusian music and Andalusian music in Algeria and in Tunisia. And I realized that there was only a small paragraph about 
the Libyan Andalusian music. And I said, you know, I mean, I think that I can do something on this. Um, uh, a week after, I uh, when well, I expressed all these thoughts to a, a dear friend of mine in anthropology, and he told me, you know, we're we're exploring this topic, um, and. I remember, I mean, he he brought me in contact with the World Islamic Call Society in Malta, the World Islamic Call Society in Malta, and uh, they arranged um, a visit for me, um, uh, uh, which has taken place, I think, um, uh, a month after. And a month after my meeting with the director of the World Islamic Call in Malta, I found myself in Libya. I met this Hassan Arabi. I had a very long interview with him. Um, he uh, introduced me to his orchestra, but that was my first my first trip. In my second trip, I decided to do it all on my own, freely. And uh, I went there then in, the, in, the, in my second trip and I met Hassan Arabi again and he was so helpful. He introduced me also to people in Zawaya just for me to experience, you know, the both, both types of Maluf, the professionalist Maluf and the Maluf, uh, the traditional Maluf, the Maluf as Zawiya. Later on, I also, I'm seeing, that was the, the one, <clears throat> that's Hassan Arabi, the one we do, would is um, Professor Abdullah Sebe. At that time, he was a professor of musicology. Um, uh, Arabic musicology at Al Fatah University. Now it is the University of Tripoli. Um, uh, he's living in Canada now, and it was like my mentor, sort of. Um, uh, he um, explained to me, I mean, the different modes in this Andalusian music, in this Malouf, in Libya, and what it means, and how people how people come together to make this kind of music. So he was he was extremely helpful. Both so, they were both helpful. Let me ask you a question. Um, because you know you went on, you went online and you found a paragraph about this stuff, right? Yeah. Is there is that because there isn't much scholarship on it, or that's because there isn't much knowledge about it? So once you got there, are these are these musicians that you're speaking to? Are they pulling their hair out, saying nobody pays attention to us, <laughs> or or do you know, Libyans on the street know this music and understand this music. They're like, yeah, yeah just nobody writes about it. What, yeah, which one that, is it? Um, hmm. Yes, I think that um, uh, there was a kind of disinterest in Libyan music. And I think that there's still, there's still um, a little bit of disinterest in Libyan music somehow. Um, uh, when I went to Libya, um, after the first trip, I, I've written my first my first article in a Maltese newspaper about my first experience in Libya. And I went in my second trip, I went with this article there. And, you know, I felt a little, I felt a sense of, you know, thank you for showing all this to the world. I mean, um, because um, it's great music and, you know, we, we deserve, you know, to be, to, be, to be known and to make our music known to the world. So I got that kind of feeling. Um, uh, yeah, but when I, when, when I was in Libya, I, I, I had a lot of support, you know, from, from uh, musicians in the orchestra of Hassan Arabi, from, you know, musicians in Zawaya, from professors, from, from so many people. And I felt this, this um, pleasure, sort of, you know, that, I am helping them making their musical tradition more known to the Western world, to the Western world. Um, uh, and that was also yeah. a kind of satisfaction the, for me that the, I was contributing, you know. Yeah. Okay, so two questions. The first is, uh, in the, does the North African world all sort of recognize, like this orchestra that we're seeing on the, on the screen now, uh, or this ensemble, are they playing all over North Africa? Do people in, you know, are, are fans of Andalusian music, style music, aware of their work? You know, are, are they publishing publishing albums as well or concert recordings? Yes, of course, of course. There are even recordings of this, of, of this Andalusian orchestra. And, uh, 
from the 1960s. And they part in the 1960s, they participated in a festival of Andalusian music in Morocco. Um, yeah. and, there are, and there is also a recording. Of Do you have any recording. recommendations for recordings people should check out? Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, uh, there aren't so many examples um, uh, of Maluf of Maluf um, in the circulation. In the circulation, I um, w- well, I have their collection, a Maluf collection of Hassan Arabi and his orchestra. It is an audio cassette collection. They were working on transferring all that on CDs, but that was a year or two before the beginning of the war uh, or the, the beginning of the of the of the arabic spring i'm not sure at what stage is that is that is that um, process but for sure there are several example examples on youtube of the uh, of the um, maluf libyan maluf and most, most of those examples are coming from hassan arabi's orchestra which okay, are great. Um, okay. very good examples. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I want to jump to talking a little bit more about your work on Maltese music, and then I'm sure there'll be more questions in the chat about Libya. Um, at a high level, you know, walk through, if you don't mind, giving sort of like a little bit of an introduction into the sort of segments of Maltese popular music and their influences. You talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but if you were to give, you know, a paragraph, the opening paragraph to a high schooler who wants to learn about Maltese music, what is that opening paragraph? What are the things that they need to understand? Thank you for that question. Um, Yes, what we are seeing, there's a publication that will be out in uh, in April, I think 20 or 21st April. Yes, that is basically um, a compilation of essays on Maltese popular music. Now, by Maltese popular music, I'm referring to Maltese Maltese folk music, the wind band tradition, and modern popular music as well. And modern popular music as well. Um, uh, Well, Maltese popular music, I can divide it into three genres. There is the, um, as I said, there is this Ana, Maltese Ana, which is very interesting. Some of it is also improvised on site. You know, there are also um, similar um, genres in other parts of the Mediterranean. We call it Spear to Prawns. But probably in Syria, they, they have something similar called Zajil. And uh, in northern Italy, there is the um, uh, Cantia con- Contrasti. And uh, Canto a Chitarra in Sardinia uh, and in Corsica, there, there is also a- another similar form. So we're talking about this folk music, Maltese folk music, mainly Anna. It is normally performed in bars. Um, it is also performed during village festas. As one of the photos there, it's a, it's a village festa. It is um, uh, an activity which is taking place a week before the village festa. Yes, and there, there is also the wind band tradition. As I said, um, uh, we have this strong wind band tradition of you know, band clubs all over Malta. They are very active organizing feasts, village feasts, um, all on a voluntary basis. They um, play festive marches, but they also perform uh, formal concerts, opener concerts. And then we also have this modern popular music. Um, uh, Our modern popular music, it knows also some of its beginning to Valletta. We have, uh, there there was, um, you know, um, a red light district in Valletta known as Strada Stretta. Um, in the night, it was already active in the 1930s. Um, musicians learned jets, Maltese musicians learned jets there. They mixed up with foreign jets musicians. So there was this cross fertilization sort of ideas coming from abroad, local ideas coming together into jets music. Hmm. Um, uh, so those are basically 
And then uh, in my book, I also discuss the use of pop music in contemporary Maltese political propagandas. Interesting. I uh, want to ask a, a, a question about the word, uh, the word Anna, which for those of you who can't see the screen, it's spelled G-H-A-N-A, -A, like yeah. the country Ghana or Ghana. Yeah. Um, does that come from the Arabic word to sing? Aina, yes, of course, a song. You know, the GH is soundless in Maltese. Um, okay. Ana, uh, yeah, Ana, it's the general term, you know, is the general term for Maltese folk song because then you have to specify which type of Ana you are referring to. We have narrative songs, as I said, that is known as Ana Talfat. We have um, melismatic Ana, Ana Bliksur. Um, uh, and we also have improvised Ana, Ana Spiritu Pront. Um, yes, Anna exists also in parallel with other, with other uh, similar traditions. For instance, in our narrative songs in the Anna Talfat, we have songs about conflicts between, you know, um, uh, the Ottoman Empire and, and, uh, and, and the Maltese and conflicts of religion. Um, uh, we have, you know, stories about um, uh, you know, um, the killing of a child by his own mother. Um, uh, we also have this narrative that shocked the Maltese at some time in Maltese history. And what is interesting is that some of these narrations, some of these stories are preserved in songs. And that is really something great. Some people think that Anna is something of the past. But in Anna, we also find especially in improvised Anna, we also find contemporary issues which are being debated as well. You know, um, hunting regulations. The new hunting regulations are sometimes debated in Anna. You know, um, uh, you know uh, uh, there are other issues, contemporary issues, like, for instance, um, uh, high electricity and water bills. Sometimes, the, 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 sometimes the, those are also discussed or they become a topic of an improvised, of improvised Anna singing. Sure, the rent is too damn high. So the idea that Anna is something of the past, that is, well, it, it is not precise because Anna in itself also looks at what is going on in the present sort of, eh? at yeah. present issues. Okay, great. I want to move on to the quick Q&A. Um, and so let's talk uh, about some of these quick questions and then we'll open it up to the chat. I see that we have questions from Neil and if there's any other questions, we'll add them to the list as well. So the first one is, what are you reading or watching right now? Good. Um, at the moment, I'm reading a very, very interesting book by Dwight Reynolds. I have it here in front of me, um, if I find it. Well, there we are. Um, it is about the musical heritage of Al-Andalus. It's an exceptional book. It's really good. It, it was published, I think, two or, or three, three months ago. So it's very recent. And we have a very nice historical, um, a very nice, ha nice historical account of, you know, Andalusian music and how it moved from the Iberian Peninsula to the Maghreb. And uh, so on, so uh, and so forth. I'm also reading a book about about um, Strasti, Stata Stretta, written by uh, George Cini. Uh, George Cini, he's a Maltese author, and this book is really interesting because um, uh, it's full of interviews with musicians who worked in Stray Street in Valletta's red light district how they interacted also with foreign musicians um, and uh, what some of these musicians, um, uh, uh, well, and Stata Stata for these musicians was like a music college, a jazz college. Uh, they go there, they perform music there and they learn on site. So those so are- the Who was, just to understand that, that time, who was the governing power at the time? Um, at the time, Walter was um, under the um, under the and under the Brits. Uh, it's almost it was, like the international zone in Tangier, almost. Yeah, yeah. 
in fact, what you are saying, it's really interesting because I met, um, uh, in my, in, in, when I was reading this book, I met someone called Robert Edwin Juice Wilson, who was um, an American jazz clarinet player who came to Malta and he played and he performed in this uh, Valletta's Red Light District. But after leaving Malta, um, he went to Lebanon and to Morocco as well. And uh, it seems to me that he's a very interesting person that, you know, um, we need to um, explore and to read more about. He followed, he followed the red light. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay great. Um, okay, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Well, several people, several people. But um, I love composition, I love film music, and I would probably do something different from research. And I can't, I can't, I can't shadow him now. Um, it's Ennio Morricone, Ennio Morricone, the Italian um, uh, film composer Ennio Morricone. I met him once, coincidentally, in Rome, um, in a cafeteria. I introduced myself to him. We talked about his film music about Malta, and I was very much impressed you know, by his character. Um, and I, if I had to shadow him, I would probably like to, you know, shadow him for a day in a recording studio. His music is simple, but very effective. Uh, is there a specific score that you are most attached to? Yes, one which probably, um, um, it is not so popular, but I love it. It's um, from an Italian TV series called La Piovra, La Piovra. Um, I love I love the music of that TV series. I love it. But he's got other. I mean, his other 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 scores as well. Cool. Very. Are you you feel like you're influenced as a composer by his work? Um, I think so. I think so. I think so. I mean, um, uh, to me, to me, he sounds Mediterranean somehow. He sounds Mediterranean. No, don't. Don't ask me what that really means, <laughs> but he sounds Mediterranean. Um, yeah, but I'm very much impressed by, by how he combines simplicity with effectiveness. That is something that I really admire in his music. Okay, great. What do people most misunderstand about your work? Yeah, um, I would probably say, I, I don't want people to read my books, you know, um, localized. I mean, when I write about um, the Libyan Malouf, um, well, I'm, I, I, I write about the Libyan Malouf, but I'm also writing about people making music. I'm also writing about the intentions of people using music for their own benefits, for their own interests. So I'm very much in, I would very much like my readers not to read me in a localized context, you know, Maltese music, so he's talking about Maltese folk music or Maltese wind band music or Maltese pop music. But I'm, t I'm, I'm writing about human beings. I'm writing, I'm writing about the aspirations of um, different men and women who use music in different ways to express themselves. And sometimes they put into their music, into their participation as well, the way they view the world around them. So I'm very, I'm, I would very much like my readers to, you know, to read me broadly, rather than, you know, in a localized uh, or localized um, way of how one can read a book. That is, that is to say that read you as an ethnomusicologist as opposed to being a musicologist. Th th that's the purpose of ethnomusicology. Yeah. I mean, that in ethnomusicology, we're supposed always to look at the wider picture, right? Of the wider picture. Yeah. Jonathan Shannon, who is on the call, who uh, we had the call with uh, two days ago, said almost precisely the exact same thing. So you both are being misunderstood yeah. in the same way. <laughs> That's uh, central to all ethnomusicology. <laughs> okay, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? I'm sure there are many, but if you were to pick one or two. Well, um, that's a good question. Um, well, in ethnomusicology, I am very much. I was very much inspired, and I see. I still see a lot of relevance in uh, in the writings of John Blacking, for instance. Uh, in the writings of John Blacking, 
Um, Jihad Reisi, um, Jihad Reisi um, from Arabic music. There's also Professor Abdullah Sebey in Libyan music. I was very much impressed by his commitment to write about Libyan music in the middle of a civil war. Uh, he continues writing about Libyan music in the middle of a civil war. Um, but I'm very much um, uh, inspired by uh, the works and the poem, the, the, the poetry of a Maltese poet, Oliver Frigili, who passed away um, in November of last year. I know him as a poet. I know him as a colleague at the university. He was a, you know, a, a professor of literature. I was always impressed by his productivity. I was always impressed by his um, high research quality. I was always uh, impressed by his, you know, um, uh, by his poetry and the way he extrays human beings uh, through, through literature and through, and through poetry. I love his poetry so much that I have even um, composed two or three classical songs based on his, on three of his poems. So um, there are, yes, classical songs for soprano and piano. And wow, beautiful. based on, uh, on his poetry. Fantastic. Um, okay, we're gonna go to the questions. Uh, Neil, you're up first. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, wonderful talk, highly interesting. Um, Libya is uh, between the Maghreb and the Mashriq in, in a geographical and a political way very much. Musically, uh, I was wondering, is Libya closer to, to Tunis or to Egypt? And in a way, giving uh, the Andalusian music, is, it, is um, Libya in a way a meeting point between uh, Maghreb Andalus music and the Mashahad after it went all the way through the Levant, or is it a sort of uh, extension of the Maghreb? Yes, that's a very, very interesting question. Thank you for that question. Yes, Libya, the music of Libya and the, the Malouf in particular, in particular, absorbs from many, many, many areas. It absorbs from the east, from the west, from everywhere, even from Egypt. Uh, but, but, the Libyan Malouf um, is very much, let me put it differently, was very much modeled on the Tunisian Malouf. Oh, yeah. Because Hassan Arabi got his training in the Libyan Malouf from Tunisia. So he went to the Rashidiya Institute. You know, he, he, he learned how to, um, how to organize an orchestra, a Malouf orchestra. And he brought all those ideas from Tunisia into Libya. And so he modeled his 1964 professional orchestra on what, what he had experienced in Tunisia, uh, on the new model, new Malouf model of Tunisia. But again, but even in the Malouf in itself, it's got several influences. It absorbs from many, so many areas, from the East and the West. Yes, Libya, it's in between. Yeah. And maybe, is there a difference between East and West Libya? Politically, there is, ethnically. Um, so politically, it's... there is. Um, if, yeah, if we take the Malouf, the Malouf, um, the Malouf is mainly concentrated in Tripoli. Yeah. In Tripoli. But there are Malouf orchestras, let's say, in Benghazi, hmm. okay. in Muizrata, but... Um, um, Lahla Malouf, the sweetest Malouf, the best Malouf, eh, is that of Tripoli. Mm? At least that's what the Libyans think, or what some of the Libyans think. Let me put it that way. Um, but yeah, but yeah, but even in Benghazi, for instance, um, there there was or there is um, a Malouf orchestra, but uh, the Malouf is mainly concentrated in Tripoli. Thank you. Great. Um, I know uh, Jonathan may have had a comment. My yeah, God. Jonathan, Hi, go ahead. How are you? Nice to see you. First of all, apologies for joining a little bit late. I had car trouble on the way down uh, from campus Alhamdulillah. home. Um, Alhamdulillah, everything's okay. But I just wanted to say, nice you. <laughs> oh, great. Um, and I was just in my comment just to say it was not really a question that I still remember very fondly when you took us to that cafe bar in this little corner of Malta with my students. 
and this is 2013 in the summer, and we actually experienced this Ana Espiritu Plant performance. This little bar with the funky guitars that they made, because uh, one thing that they do, they make their own guitars, and they're really great uh, with extra resonating chambers. And they sang this uh, song, and we didn't, none of us understood other than Philip and somebody else. Um, and then, yet we could, we could hear that they began to incorporate the students into their poetry because they're referring, and as somebody was translating for me, you could hear the, like the word American, for example, and these sorts of things coming out. And this show, there's these guys in this local bar cafe, and they, they were so skilled that they could incorporate us into their improvised poetry. And it reminded me of a time you mentioned Dwight Reynolds text. I went on a mission for Dwight back in 1996 up to this little village in the Egyptian Delta to give regards to um, some of his earlier hosts. And they performed for us, or a group of us, American students from Cairo. We went up there and these um, Beni Hillel uh, performers were sitting around doing this sort of Sirat Beni Hillel, this sort of oral tradition and then yet we, we, and we can understand Arabic and suddenly we find ourselves incorporated into the poetry uh, in a really funny way. Like there are these Americans come to the court and they're, they're misers and they're not giving us any money and they're, doing, you know, they're eating our food. And, they're like, and it was really funny. It was the parallels were great. You have these oral traditions around the Mediterranean that are still living. And even if they're very ancient and they're very inventive and innovative. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand about this tradition. It's not tradition, like some sort of museum piece that sits there and you press play and you hear it. It's actually something that's very much alive. And I appreciate your work for showing us that. And it's another thing you should all know that Philip's not only somebody who studies music, he actually composes music as well. He mentioned that a little bit. And this, his music's very interesting. It's this interesting form of ethnomusicology that's engaged with what um, people are doing, not just studying it as some sort of weird object, something that's very much alive. And so his work is, is fabulous for that reason. Oh. Thank you, Jonathan. I mean, yes, Jonathan, what you are saying, it's, um, it's really, um, uh, it's really right, because <clears throat> I always experience the same problem when I take students to the bar, to these bars. Um, they always incorporate me, in, include me in their singing. They always refer to me in their singing. Um, and I really sometimes feel embarrassed, you know, to find myself part of the poetry. <laughs> Um, but I got used to it now. I got used to it, believe me. But it's very interesting because we, they sometimes debate on what is going on in the bar. Uh, so they almost absorb the context, they absorb the environment into their poetry. Uh, they transform the environment into poetry because they have to, to rhyme. I mean, yeah, like Zajal. Uh, like Zajal. Like Zajal, yeah. yes, of course, in yeah. Syria, I think. You know, even in Lebanon, I think, um, yeah. you have you have Zajel as well. Um, so you find yourself part of the singing, you know, and they start talking about this professor who is with his students, you know, um, and I feel really embarrassed. <laughs> you know, Fantastic. In the bar, um, you know, um, these Anneya, how these people, these singers are, you know, singing about, about, about me and about the students, you know, um, yeah, it's a really funny thing. Thank That's you for great. that. Oh, thank you for that, George. I, yeah, I remember. I remember that cruise and that that tour that you had with your students in Malta. I still remember that. Yes. Okay, we'll take the last question from Jan Marie, who is my mom, who is a choral uh, oh, right. uh, music uh, teacher as well. So go for it. Thank you. <clears throat> it's very fascinating. Very fascinating um, um, interview. Thank you. I've been to Malta, but I can't say that I had the the pleasure of hearing the music that we that you discussed today. But <clears throat> from what I've read about the Maltese, that they it, I've read that they have a natural ability to sing and rhyme. So uh, and I was also reading about how women would stand on the rooftops and be hanging out their clothes and they'd be singing to each other across the rooftop, rooftops. And the singing was just part of their natural way of passing by their daily chores. So is this music, do you have a strong choral tradition in your schools where this music is taught or is it <clears throat> just passed on from one generation to the next? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the scenes that you are describing are very interesting. They were part of, you know, um, uh, 19th century literature on uh, on uh, on Maltese folk music. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, this kind of 
music, yeah, it's, it's always transmitted from one generation to the other, eh? especially from father to son, son to grandson, so on and so forth. Unfortunately, this kind of singing, but it is not taught in schools. Um, uh, it is, uh, it's sometimes it is also um, that kind of singing which is on the periphery because it is sometimes associated with uh, certain social classes and then social and certain low social status. And uh, so some people feel that if you go into Anna, they might be compromising, they might be, you know, devalue themselves socially. Um, so there, is, there, there are also these um, um, political sort of these political um, uh, links with Anna. But it's a pity that, that this kind of music is not formally taught in schools. It is not part of the music curriculum. Okay, so um, uh, if, you, if you want to listen to Anna nowadays, basically what you have to do is to go to a bar or to wait um, uh, until May. And uh, there is this annual Anna Fest, which is held in Malta every May or June of every year. Um, yeah, but thank you for that observation. I mean, it's a pity that we are not teaching this kind of singing in schools. It should be teaching, it, it should be taught in schools. But, well, mm. there are several, the, uh, several currents, you know, um, yeah. under needs that need to be sorted first be before it enters uh, the music curriculum, sort of. Thank well, you. Thanks so much, Philip. This was a, a great conversation. I'm really, really happy that we were able to expand. You know, we always say that we would try to uh, explore new sections of the library. And for me, this was definitely a new section of the library. So thank you so much for taking the time to share with us. Thank you for this invitation. It was a great pleasure to be with you and, um, uh, and to be part of this very interesting project. Thank you, yeah, Mikey. Thanks so much. Hope, hope to see you on some of the upcoming calls as well. Yes, um, inshallah. Everybody enjoy your day, enjoy your night and take care. Thank you all. Thank you.